Welcome to The Rational Live. I'm your host, David Dole. How's it going? Uh, a lot to talk about today. Some actual news coming up. <laughs> but I'm going to talk a bit about, sh very shortly, briefly, the uh, apparent controversy over a Twitch streamer buying a house. And then I'll get to some actual news. So to give you a little preview of today, actually, before I give you the preview, how could I forget? I also want my own house uh, in LA. So <laughs> if you want to buy me a house, therationalnational.com slash join. That's the Patreon page, help support the show. Or you can support me through uh, Super Chats that I'll read out throughout the stream or um, join on YouTube, PayPal, other various ways. Links are below the video in the description box on YouTube. So check that out. All right, now uh, let me give you a little preview. So I will <laughs> briefly be discussing the Hassan thing. It's not going to be its own segment. I I mean, maybe I could make it its own segment, but it's mostly just some reactions online and uh, my thoughts on the whole thing. Also, Biden cancels student debt for some. I'll tell you what that's about and the uh, larger question that it raises. Also, what else here? Conservatives in Nova Scotia uh, defeated liberals by running to the left. So I'll tell you what happened there and the lessons, the obvious lesson coming from that election. Also, another Canadian story, Doug Ford caught using a disgusting fundraising scheme. I'll show you what that's about. And uh, this story that I is half prepared, <laughs> so I may still cover it. Larry David reportedly yelling at Alan Dershowitz at a Martha Vineyard grocery store. And then I'll do the wrap up that has a bunch of random stories into one that I didn't get to this week. All right. How's it all going? How uh, How's everybody? Let's start with this. There is major controversy online over a Twitch streamer, Hassan Piker, buying a home in LA. Now, I think this is ridiculous. <laughs> Does it, it, it's, if anyone didn't know that Hassan had money before, 
I mean, he's always had this money. So whether he spends it on a home or not, the money's there. But this is a guy who does fantastic work. It educates people to become more uh, uh, more aware of of what's going on, of the the power structures in place. He is a great voice for educating. Very successful, of course, on Twitch, and now he's bought a home. I think the home, I guess it's worth around $3 million. It's it's in L.A. I think most homes in L.A. are <laughs> around a $1 million. But I don't, I don't see an issue with this. And apparently there are people online trying to make an issue out of it, but there's never been an issue with amassing wealth. It's all about how you do that. So, you know, the real issue, of course, is billionaires. And if you compare millionaires to billionaires, just... There is a massive difference between someone that has a million dollars and someone that has a billion dollars. I mean, I hope people realize that. But if you're going to be a billionaire, you are absolutely exploiting labor. And that's the biggest issue with that kind of wealth. All that wealth for an individual when they are exploiting labor and not paying their employees enough. In the case of Hassan, that's clearly not the issue here. Um, he is not exploiting anybody. He streams. He does a ton of work every day streaming online. Um, and I think I think he has some people that he pays to do editing work, but he pays them to do editing work. So there's no issue there. Let me show you some of the reactions online that um, some of the better reactions online. <laughs> I'm not going to show you the lunatics. Actually, I'll show you one near the end, I think. But let's start here. Uh, Ken Klippenstein tweeting out, really don't give an F about how much money people make if they support taxing the rich. I completely agree. It's all about what you advocate for. And if you're actually honest about that, that advocacy, if you're actually fighting for that, or if you're just grifting the right wing. Anna Kasparian here tweeting out, I'd like to congratulate Hassan for building a successful career without having to suck up to right wingers like Tucker Carlson. Enjoy the home. Nothing wrong with having nice things. Jank Uger here, who, of course, is Hassan's uncle. So <laughs> some bias here, but still, I think this is a fair point. Says here, I'm super proud of Hassan for becoming incredibly popular without selling out or shilling for right-wingers. He stuck to his principles and never chased right-wing or mainstream media approval or cash like a sad little puppy dog. He won people over by being his own man. Hashtag respect. Mike from PA tweeting out, the Hassan controversy reminds me just how much of a socialist slash leftist movement is, uh, uh, how much of the socialist slash leftist movement is lifestyleism and aesthetics. Living in poverty or refusing to consume do absolutely nothing to end the exploitative relations that we live in uh, under capitalism. Wake the F up. This, uh, <laughs> this exchange here. So Nikki shared this. So this person, I don't know who this is. I, I think they're also a streamer. But here they're criticizing... Um, the uh, the home purchase saying, I simply do not understand why hundreds of people think that I'm trying to say he should be homeless and poor, like there is no standard of living between that and being a millionaire basking in personal wealth. It's not a good argument. And then um, <laughs> some replies saying, I simply don't understand why you don't just put your phone down and go outside. And then Alexis replies saying, Che Fidel would be disappointed in your defending this man. Then somebody replies, what was Fidel's net worth? Uh, I looked it up. It's it was around nine hundred million dollars. So um, clearly not the <laughs> not the right way to try and criticize Hassan over this purchase. Anthony Fantano, uh, the internet's busiest music nerd, jumping in here, saying Hassan can't make bank as a streamer while professing leftist values, is bitching about Bernie Sanders selling books and having a second house on the agenda next. Do we have the time for AOC wearing an expensive dress on a magazine cover too? Get your effing priorities straight. Last one here, Ethan Klein of H3H3 saying, y'all really think Hassan shouldn't be able to own a nice house and also champion for the poor and underprivileged? There is a difference between making millions on Twitch and paying 50% in taxes and Jeff Bezos being worth $150 billion and paying no taxes. Happy Hassan is crushing it. Absolutely. There is a massive difference between the two. So... Again, this is not really a story, but this trended on Twitter, Hassan buying this house, even in Canada, I was looking at trends and Hassan's name was trending. Absolutely wild. But outside of Twitter and, you know, some online circles, I don't think people even are aware of this or even really care. Someone buying a home that they earned through hard work. Congrats. All right. Uh, there we go. I don't think I'll cut that out into its own segment, but no, I won't. <laughs> I really don't think I will. All right. Um, maybe I'll grab some random chats now on, since we're on this topic before I get to the real news today, let me just do some, uh, quick, 
quick scrolls here. All right. Uh, Black Caucus says Hassan doesn't make his money from trying to destroy progressives and turning people against each other. Nothing wrong with him buying a home. Agreed. Um, Noble says socialism is when no money. <laughs> Hilarious. Uh, what else? The left should abandon Twitter, says Sour Spark. You know what? Not a horrible idea. Um, what else here? Scrolling up for some other random chats, and then we'll get going. <clears throat> Someone says, cancel Hassan. That's from Alex. I think you're joking based on the caps. And, uh, all right, that's enough. Maybe one more. Christine says, hey, they attacked Bernie because he had a nice winter coat. <laughs> I remember that. I covered that. It was a gift from his son, but people were mad because it didn't come from the goodwill. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Advocating for leftist policy doesn't mean that you should all live in squalor. I mean, I hope people realize that. All right. Um, Mark here. Uh, will Hassan's shoulders fit through the door? <laughs> Maybe that's why he had to spend so much. He had to buy a house that had a, a wide enough uh, uh, door frame. All right. Um, thoughts on current affairs? I'll get some more on that later. I didn't, I didn't prep for that. Uh, there's actually conflicting news about that. I read another aspect of that today. So basically, you know, I hate having to do this all on the fly because I don't have anything in front of me. But um, basically, the story is that Current Affairs' uh, staff and, and Nathan J. Robinson, who, who's the editor-in-chief, were uh, attempting to form, I guess, a worker co-op. And then apparently, according to his employees, he then fired people who were trying to do that. But ultimately, he came out today saying, no, they, he was already making as much money as everyone else on staff, which is forty-five grand a year, which is not a lot of money. And he was making the same, again, as his staff was. And um, they were already, in many ways, uh, an egalitarian, uh, you know, uh, um, magazine. But uh, ultimately, it sounds like some of the disagreement was over hiring decisions. So anyways, there's a lot to go over. It, it feels weird going over all this without any actual context or any text to to show you the actual words as opposed to going off the top of my head. But um, the whole current affairs story doesn't seem to be as as big of a deal as maybe it was as it once did when it first broke based on what has come out since but there we go we can talk more about it later if you want after i do these these stories but i will be right back to prep the next story <laughs> I saw some Black Caucus doing great job there in the in the chat. I saw some uh, ridiculous responses, and Black Caucus shut it down. 
with some facts. Thank you, sir. Also, uh, that's it. <laughs> Let's get to the next story. Here we go. Actual news now. President Joe Biden has canceled student debt for 300,000 students. And this raises a question about student debt as a whole. But first, more details on just what the administration has done. This is from the Associated Press. The Biden administration announced Thursday it will automatically erase student loan debt for more than 300,000 Americans with severe disabilities that leave them unable to earn significant incomes. The move will wipe out more than $5.8 billion in debt, according to the Education Department, and it marks the start of a broader overhaul of a program that has been criticized for having overly burdensome rules. Now, so in place already, there is an ability for um, uh, those who are permanently disabled to apply to get debt relief but to get that debt relief you have to go through this three-year waiting period where you are closely monitored so that the government can ensure you are actually disabled so it's been a massive barrier to the disabled to be able to apply for uh, student loan debt and also not, not even to mention like a massive waste of resources having to monitor you know hundreds of thousands of people to ensure they they were actually disabled it's it was a ridiculous process so it's good they have now um reversed that and then just are now canceling the debt uh outright so advocates have pressed the education department to eliminate the monitoring period entirely and to provide automatic debt relief to people who the social security administration already identifies as permanently disabled under the new action, both demands will be met. Starting in September, the Education Department will start erasing student debt for 323,000 Americans identified in Social Security records as being permanently disabled. So there you go. This has apparently been a uh, uh, a push that's been going on for a while from from these these groups that have been advocating for the disabled. So thankfully, the Biden men actually listening now, following through, eliminating this debt completely. But this now raises a larger question, as Biden and Pelosi have been claiming that the president doesn't have the authority to cancel student debt. Yet they just proved they can do it. So, and, and I, I debunked that idea in this video. If you want to go back and search for this video, Nancy Pelosi used the Republican rhetoric to slam student debt forgiveness. In that video, she claimed what I just said, that that the president can't do this and i went through the details showing how the president can and does do this and you see another example of this of that here so clearly this raises a larger question about student debt as a whole and why can't biden just erase all of it and that gets to um mondaire jones here congressman uh tweeting out in response to the news i just shared saying grateful that the biden administration has formally recognized its authority to cancel uh, student debt he must now do this for everyone so I think we're going to see a continued push from those in Congress that have been calling for this, especially now that they, the administration has just proved that they can, in fact, cancel student debt. There is now no barrier to being able to do this, and those in Congress, progressives, as well as um, uh, groups and organizations that advocate for canceling student debt should continue their, their fight, as I think there is some there is an ability here to potentially move the administration to, at some point, cancel more and potentially all student debt okay that's that story let me uh maybe prep the next one if there's some super chats i'll grab those there's a couple here samantha cider thank you for your your donation car wash freak a uh samantha cider and car wash freak both consistent supporters thank you car wash freak says is there a way to overcome gerrymandering in 2022 well my understanding is the voting rights bill um, that you know requires uh, 60 votes to pass deals with with some of that. So you know this is part of the importance or part of the reason why it's so important to get rid of the the filibuster. But um, that's the way to deal with it is deal with the, the voting rights legislation now, pass that now, get rid of the filibuster so it's possible to actually pass that and. Uh, if they don't do that, Republicans are going to just continue rigging these elections and continue winning. All right, I will be right back prepping the next story, which is a Canadian story, but has a larger lesson, I think, for politics in the West in general. I will be right back.
Back now. This story is, uh, is kind of interesting, actually. I hope you like it. Progressive conservatives won a massive upset this week in Nova Scotia, winning a majority provincial government by running to the left of the Liberal Party. So just for American viewers, progressive conservatives are the conservative party in Nova Scotia. Liberals are supposed to be at least somewhat to the left of uh, the PCs, but progressive conservatives won by running to the left of the Liberals. So first, let's take a look at the upset portion of this, as this was the ratings on August 17th in the morning what the uh going into the election what was assumed to happen so liberals were supposedly going to uh maintain a government here winning 25 seats pcs at 16 and the ndp at five well compare that to what happened that night just a complete reversal so in fact the pcs ended up winning 31 seats being able to form a majority government Liberals down at 17 and NDP at six, winning one more seat than they were projected to win. So, and this was all done by the PCs running to the left. More here from CTV News. During the campaign, Tory leader Tim Hewson unveiled a left-leaning platform that promised hundreds of millions of dollars in the first year of the party's mandate to increase the number of family doctors, bolster the mental health system, and create more nursing home beds. Compare that to the Liberals, Rankin, who was elected to lead the Liberal Party in February, argued that his party's planned investments in health care were sensible. Quote, what we don't need is a competition on who can throw the most money at an issue, the former business manager said during the debate. So look at the difference in argument here. Here you have the Conservatives making a progressive argument, the need to invest a lot more money into health care. Meanwhile, the Liberals are making the conservative argument that no, we need to be sensible, can't throw money at everything. That is a conservative argument. And they lost. So that, and it's not even just about this. <laughs> I also find it interesting that the liberals, at least in, the, in this one instance, ran to the right on a cultural or social issue. So in the first week of the campaign, the liberals faced more negative headlines after a female liberal candidate alleged party staff had pressured her to drop out of the race because she had previously sold revealing photos of herself on the website OnlyFans. Robin Ingram said the party had told her to cite her mental health issues as the reason for her departure on the first day of the campaign, which she did in writing before going public with her version of events. Here you have the liberals going to the right, pushing out a candidate because she had an OnlyFans account. Meanwhile, Trudeau in the 90s in blackface, that's perfectly fine, doesn't resign over that, but uh, this woman having an OnlyFans, oh, a bridge too far. You have to, uh, you have to get out of the race. Completely ridiculous, and I don't think this uh, this helped them either. Clearly, now there is, I think, you know, the obvious takeaway from from this from this victory by the conservatives is that you have here a uh, politics continue moving to the left in the West. The, the actual when it comes to the actual policies, what people support. Voters support investments into health care. Voters support higher wages. Voters support infrastructure investments. Voters support these more progressive issues, when it especially when it comes to the economic issues. So to have a conservative party be able to run to the left of the liberal party and win, that shows you there is no, there is really no, no limit here in terms of what these parties should be calling for. The NDP should go as far left as possible in this next election. The liberals as well, if they are honest about actually helping people, go far left. And the conservatives <laughs> might as well go far left. People want to see an investment. Coming out of this pandemic, people want to see a real investment into, uh, into health care, into infrastructure, into society in general. They don't care about you know the, the, the debt, the deficit. They care about actual investments into people's lives into the public and clearly when a conservative party can win on that message then it's obviously a winning message all right now will they learn that lesson no <laughs> no they will not learn that lesson but uh that should be the lesson that all these parties take away i would love for the entire discourse to move to the left as clearly that is how you win elections all right um if there are super chats, I'll grab them. If not, I will move on. Law Gnome's here. 
always a strong supporter. Thank you, Lawn Gnomes. Says, thanks for the cool collab this morning, breaking down some quality control on the left. As we get closer to the end of the year, can you add candidate announcement slash redistricting update uh, segment? Uh, as we get closer to the end of the year, can you add candidate announcement? Uh, well, I'll talk, whenever a candidate, you know, announces and it stands out to me, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. I'm not going to make any promises in terms of like a consistent segment. The idea of asking me to do anything consistently... <laughs> It's hard enough doing this live stream, so I can't, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I'll do that. But um, in terms of covering candidates that are running, like I've covered Jessica Cisneros that has announced, uh, she's announced her run again against Henry Cuellar. I think someone else else announced this week that was a Justice Dem in the past that's running again. So I'll mention those when I can. Uh, but in terms of, you know, elections this month, I'll be a lot more focused on the Canadian election as that is going to be on September 20th. So I'll be focusing more on on those races, but the, but after that, you know, we'll see, we'll see uh, what I do. Also, yeah, in terms of the collab this morning, yeah, check out my interview with Case Study QB on the channel. is a uh, it's great talking to him. I've of course used many of the uh, clips that he has pulled out of cable news, and that was a uh, a fun discussion. All right, I'll be right back as I prep this next story. <laughs> This story is, uh, is something else. Doug Ford's conservative government in Ontario was caught sending out fake invoices in an attempt to scam supporters into sending donations to the party. So first, let me show you what this fake invoice looked like. Here you have, this is a fake invoice. It says right here, invoice at the top. This one's for $300. And it says, please respond today, balance due, $300. Please pay the enclosed invoice. This is really disgusting. And as we'll get to in a second here, uh, this is the kind of thing, that this is the kind of scam that, you know, scammers use when they're calling, when either sending through mail or, or phone calls where they largely target seniors to try and scam them out of money. This is out of that same playbook. Absolutely disgusting. A little more here from the star. Premier Doug Ford's progressive conservatives have apologized for mailing out fake invoices, soliciting cash from past donors after a firestorm of controversy. Quote, at no time was it our intention to mislead our valued supporters, the Tories said in a statement Thursday after refusing uh, comments on the issue for more than 24 hours. Quote, we regret that this correspondence was sent to a limited group of supporters by one of our vendors and will not happen again. We apologize for any confusion or frustration this may have caused, the party said. At no time was it our intention to mislead our val valued supporters. The whole point of this is to mislead your supporters. That is why it is designed this way, to try and trick people into sending you money. 
which may have happened or almost happened in this case. Quote, I didn't know what it was for. A senior citizen who asked that his name not be used told the star after receiving an invoice for $2,100 in the mail Wednesday. That's the amount he had donated to the party in the past. So that's how they figured out what, what number to put on the invoice is how much you put you you gave them in the past. They put that on the invoice as if you owe that to the party. Absolutely disgusting. Now, the question comes is why does Doug Ford need to even do this when he's holding these $1,000 plate fundraisers? So this is from uh, 2019. Doug Ford defends $1,250 a plate fundraiser, says it's not cash for access. <laughs> when that's obviously what it is, you're talking to rich donors, lobbyists, people that, that you know, want to uh, get in your ear, influence your politics, influence what you do. Obviously, it's about access. And that, of course, isn't the only time he's done, he's done this multiple times. Here's, you know, another example. NDP grills Ford over $1,000 per burger fundraiser in North Bay. That is from July of this year. So, yeah, this is what Doug Ford does. And uh, he, he both tries to scam his supporters into sending him more money. And also holds these fundraisers with, with rich donors, the people that he actually cares about, the people that he actually listens to. And uh, just a couple examples here of why Doug Ford is disgusting and needs to be replaced next year. All right. There we go. Quick little story on that. Now, what do I have? Larry David. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll do the Larry David story. It's like half prepped, but I'll figure it out. Before I do that, if there's any chats, I'll grab those. And I'm losing my voice right now, which is not is not good. All right, no more chats. Let me go to uh, the Be Right Back screen as I prep this next story. I see the chat is still engaged in the Hassan discussion. <laughs> this, man, if I just covered drama all day like some losers do, I would be uh, making bank. Um, not Hassan Bank. <laughs> he does actual good work. But the the drama stuff is just ridiculous. I try to actually educate people, but, you know, th that doesn't always hit as, as hard as some other stuff does. All right. Let me do this story. Seinfeld co-creator and Curb Your Enthusiasm legend Larry David apparently yelled at former friend Alan Dershowitz in a Martha's, Martha's Vineyard grocery store. Now, Alan Dershowitz, of course, is a lawyer. He was a member of the defense team for Harvey Weinstein, member of the defense team for Trump's first impeachment, and a member of the defense team for Jeffrey Epstein in the uh, early 2000s. But let me here uh, start with just the exchange they had. So you see here, headline from IndieWire. Larry David confronts Alan Dershowitz in a heated encounter at Martha's Vineyard grocery store. So this is apparently verified by somebody who witnessed it and also verified by Dershowitz, who, of course, was there. But uh, they apparently, you know, randomly came into contact with each other at this grocery store. And David, Larry David was apparently ignoring him. And then um, Dershowitz said to David, we can still talk, Larry. David replied saying, no, no, we really can't. I saw you. I saw you with your arm around former Trump Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. It's disgusting. 
Dershowitz said, he's my former student at Harvard Law. I greet all of my former students that way. I can't greet my former students. To which David replied, it's disgusting. Your whole enclave, it's disgusting. You're disgusting. <laughs> I absolutely love Larry David. You have to make these people, especially if, if you're friends with these people, you know, obviously no one that, wa- no, no one that watches me likely is uh, one of these elites in Hollywood. But if you happen to be friends with someone like Alan Dershowitz, yeah, cut them out of your life. Make them feel uncomfortable. You can't just do the most disgusting shit and claim, oh, it's my job, whatever, and and think that you're going to ma- be able to maintain these relationships. And the way this goes on, I mean, Alan Dershowitz, who uh, was interviewed by Page Six over this discussion. Uh, so <laughs> first of all, I want to read this. So Page Six, uh, Page Six's source said Larry walks away. Alan takes off his T-shirt to reveal another T-shirt underneath it that says it's the Constitution, stupid. The source out of that Dershowitz drove off in an old, dirty Volvo. Very random details here. <laughs> Alan Dershowitz just walks around with wearing two T-shirts. All right. Anyways, but um, so Dershowitz goes on here. I, I want to. There's one piece I want to read in particular. Actually, I think I have it saved here. No, I don't. All right. Um, where he talks about how here. Dershowitz said, I'm a liberal. I'm a liberal Democrat and I voted for Biden just as enthusiastically as Larry did. Larry David is guilty of contemporary McCarthyism. McCarthy would have been proud of him, adding uh, that in the 1950s, McCarthy went after lawyers who represented people he disagreed with. That, that was about the fear around communism and socialism and trying to call those people traitors and, and prosecute them. That You don't have a right to be somebody's friend if you're a disgusting person. Or even if you're not a disgusting person, <laughs> you don't have the right to be somebody's friend. So comparing this to, to McCarthyism is so completely ridiculous. Here is Dershowitz having to actually contend with some uh, some reactions from people in his life to the actions that he has taken that he simply doesn't like. But he he's the one that caused this. He's the one that decided to defend Harvey Weinstein. He's the one that defended Donald Trump. He's the one that defended Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, this is, look at what Dershowitz was saying when he was defending Trump. Trump lawyer Alan Dershowitz. Extortion is fine if you're doing it to get reelected. That was one of his arguments. Like, you can't separate yourself from the work that you do. This is what he does day in, day out. He can pretend, you know, that's, oh, that's what, that's a role I have. That's just my, my, my livelihood. But that's not who I actually am. I voted for Joe Biden. I don't, it doesn't matter what you do in your personal life. What actually matters is your real impact on society. And this is Alan Dershowitz's impact on society. Not to mention some other stuff here. This is from Vox. A Harvard Law School professor and high-profile defense lawyer, Dershowitz helped negotiate a non-prosecution agreement under which Epstein served just 13 months in a county jail, much of it spent on work release in an office. Ever since details of that agreement were reported by Julie K. Brown of the Miami Herald, Dershowitz and his role in the deal have been under added scrutiny. That only increased this week with the publication of a New Yorker story by reporter Connie Brook detailing not just Dershowitz's role in defending Epstein, but also allegations by two women who say that they were directed to have sex with Dershowitz while in Epstein's orbit. Dershowitz vehemently denies both allegations. And in fact, Dershowitz ended up suing Netflix over the portrayal of that in a, a Jeffrey Epstein series. But to Netflix's credit, they're countersuing Alan Dershowitz over that because they likely know the facts are on their side. But you have Dershowitz here trying to separate himself from all of the disgusting shit he has done. And good on Larry David and anyone else who happens to be in the same orbit of these people that have now just completely rejected them and pushed them out of their lives. All right. I guess I did okay on that story considering it was half prepped, but uh, there you go. Now, we have the weekly wrap-up, of course. Always fun to do the weekly wrap-up. Party Peppers in a super chat says, Love what you do. Hope this helps buy your house in LA, LOL. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. I'll, all that that entire four ninety nine is going directly to my LA home. Thomas Powers sends 10 bucks. Thank you, Thomas, so much for your donation as well. Uh, <laughs> The funny thing is $3 million, well, it's a ton of money. That's like, if I showed you what you can buy in Toronto for that, you would be shocked at how shitty the house would be. (laughs) Like an average Toronto house is like $2 million or $2.5 million. Um, It's 
the housing market here is absolutely ridiculous, as it is, to be fair, in most places, in, in most big cities. But it's like another level in, in Toronto right now. It's just absolutely insane. If you want to be able to afford anything that's under a million dollars, you have to move like two hours outside the city. It's nuts. I will likely be renting for quite a long time. But at some point, I would like to, uh, you know, raise a family in a home if I can. Abel Soul says, money corrupts. System is set up for wealthy to dodge tax and even more consumption keeping the system in feedback loop. Read Peter Joseph. Thank you, Abel. All right, I'm going to prep this wrap up and uh, I will be right back. This, uh, of course, is the weekly wrap-up, and then I'll get to all chats and super chats and all that stuff after. All right. Here, uh, <laughs> I'm looking at the tabs here. This used to be called the, the, the Tweets of the Week, and then I changed it to the weekly wrap-up because it's more of like about news stories. But this week, it's literally all Twitter. <laughs> but it is still news stories. But uh, still, weekly wrap-up, I think, is a better description for what this is. All right. <clears throat> it is time once again for the weekly wrap up. These are stories that I collect throughout the week that I did not get to do a full video on, but I still want to talk about them. So let me start with this bit of uh, kind of bit of news here, but this shared by by John DeVore, who says amazing photo choice. From Business Insider, I'm a landlord with 24 properties. We're suffering during Biden's eviction ban, too, and no one is helping. And here he is standing in front of a private jet. These people, to think they're going to find empathy <laughs> for their 24 properties, this is what the guy does. He sits on properties and makes money. He does nothing all day. No, uh, that is ridiculous. I feel nothing for you at all. Next story. Dave Weigel here with this poll saying maybe the most surprising AP poll result vis-a-vis -vis the co coverage of Afghanistan. Americans are more worried about extremist groups based in the U.S. than foreign extremists. So if you have seen any of the mainstream media coverage on, on Afghanistan this week, my God, it is crazy. I did a couple of videos on it this week. It's just it's all about how, you know, Biden's got to go back in. He's got to restart the war. It's it's completely nuts, completely divorced from reality. There was oh, this was always going to be the result. What happened in Afghanistan, the Taliban taking over, was likely always going to be the result. You, they were there for 20 years. You know, an extra year or two, or even 10 more years, 20 more years, wouldn't have made a single difference. It is what it is. And the, the majority of people still agree. If you look at polls, the majority of Americans agree with Biden, with pulling out of Afghanistan. But we'll see how much, you know, the mainstream press's coverage of that has an impact on their thoughts. But at least in terms of extremist groups, 
let's take a look. So, uh, concerned, how concerned are you about the threat for, to the U.S. from extremist groups based inside the U.S.? So overall, 65% are concerned about that. More concerned about that than those based outside the U.S. So extremist groups based outside the U.S. only at 50%. So people correctly overall are more uh, afraid or, or, or see more of a threat from extremist groups in the U.S. than outside the U.S. And even looking at the numbers here, Republicans based inside the U.S., 57% are more afraid of groups inside the U.S. compared to 54% outside the U.S. So normally you would think conservatives would be more afraid of, you know, the outsiders. Well, this poll, in fact, shows otherwise. And Democrats, of course, uh, are, you know, clearly 75 there, more uh, see extremist groups inside the U.S. as more of a threat compared to 49 outside the U.S. So interesting uh, poll there. This clip, let me share this. So this is uh, Barbara Lee, the lone voice of reason against the use of force back in 2001 that led to the invasion of Afghanistan. So the single voice against the invasion of Afghanistan back in uh, a couple days after September 11th. Here you have Barbara Lee. This is, this should be the voice that every mainstream media network, every, every show is propping up is Barbara Lee, as she was the only person correct about this issue. But here she has a rare appearance discussing this on Mehdi Hassan's show, who to his credit, is doing a good job covering this. But here is Barbara Lee's comments on uh, Afghanistan and how she feels about the result. Let's hope we learn lessons. You know, we cannot nation build. Uh, this was a 20 year war, the longest war in American history. Whether you agreed or not with uh, the use of force three days after the horrific attacks, the uh, mission was accomplished years ago uh, in terms of uh, Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. And I think the president was absolutely correct in putting it in the historical context for why he made his decision, which I think was the correct decision. But the planning and uh, the movement toward where we are today, I don't think was well thought out and well planned. And so we have to do more. And so I think we need to learn the lessons of the last 20 years and just know and recognize that we can't go out throughout the world and nation build. We have many, many issues that uh, we must address in terms of global peace and security and recognize that uh, military action uh, is not gonna solve the world's problems. That's a fact. And I think we're seeing that right now. So fantastic. Uh, Barbara Lee, of course, right again, as <laughs> she was 20 years ago. And again, this should be the person that every single mainstream media outlet is having on to discuss this. Next, this piece of news is just incredible. Trudeau was announcing that if re-elected, his government would introduce 10 paid federal sick days. The change would be made through the Canada Labor Code and government would not pay for it. Here's the thing. There's no reason why the Liberals couldn't have already done this. In fact, other parties, the NDP, have been calling for this for at least a year now. So some reactions here. Luke Savage tweeting out, literally could have ta tabled this several weeks ago and it would have sailed through Parliament with ease, almost like calling an election under these circumstances had only the most cynical justification. And this from Joe Roberts, who says, every new liberal campaign promise fills me with a level of outrage I didn't know possible. They had the entirety of the pandemic to do this and didn't. They could have acted on long-term care when seniors were dying and didn't. Stop playing politics with our lives. It's incredible. And it, it really shows you that this is all about Trudeau's ego and him wanting this majority. He, he could have passed, he easily would have passed the 10 paid sick days with the support of the NDP in a minority government but didn't bother and now is promising it with his, uh, if he gets a majority, just ridiculous. This last bit of news from Input Mag here, breaking OnlyFans after building a successful and safe space for sex workers is now kicking them to the curb. This is really a disgusting bit of news. You have here OnlyFans using sex workers to build up their platform is clearly the, the largest reason anyone goes and uses that platform and now they're kicking them off um, as an attempt to try and appeal to investors when 
the, the whole reason this platform is popular is because of those workers. So it was good to see, you know, some lawmakers come out. Cory Bush had a great statement here saying using sex workers to build your platform only to kick them off once you make it big is disgusting. Sex work is work. And I completely agree. All right. There is your weekly wrap up. Hope that wasn't too long. Segment later. All right. Uh, here we go. Let's do chats. We can talk more about Hassan if you want, <laughs> since that apparently is what everyone's talking about. More, There's more chats about Hassan. Amazing. Um, amazing. I don't think people are really fully aware of the housing market and how crazy it is, but it is what it is. All right, let me grab, let me grab some super chats and then we'll do random chats that I'll respond to as well. Uh, RN says after, uh, after the WW, what are your top five video games? What's the WW? What's that supposed to mean? What are your top five video games? Um, I don't have, <laughs> when it comes to a top, top five, even a top video game, for me, it's always changing. It's like, it depends on, I feel like every year I play a game that is better than what I played the year before. Cause I think a lot of games, but that isn't always the case. Of course, you know, there are a lot of classic games that stick out to me, but it, it all depends how you pick your top. Well, you know, whether it's like top movies, top games, do you think about, is it about like, what is actually the best of the best that you've played? Or is it more about nostalgia and what, you know, certain games meant to you? Because if it's more about that, then, you know, my top five is going to be a lot of Super NES, a lot of PlayStation 2 games. Um, you know, Super Mario Kart for me is like a pivotal game in my childhood. That's that's up there. Uh, the original Ratchet and Clank games on PS2 were huge games for me back then. So, but for me to name a top five, I'm just going to get it wrong. <laughs> But Amplitude, big PS2 game that's in my top in my top five for sure. Uh, but I can't name a top five. I wish I had, you know, games in the forefront of my mind. But usually what's on my mind is what I'm playing right now. So I just finished Persona 5. Fantastic game, though. It was a bit, a bit too long, in my opinion, a bit too long. Now I'm playing through Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is my first time playing Final Fantasy. And I'm playing this wondering how the hell was this on PlayStation or how did they do this on PlayStation? Because clearly it's it's just a complete remake of what the game was. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. I kind of completely, I avoided basically all Japanese RPGs back when I was younger because I just, I couldn't get into the, uh, I think I had ADHD. <laughs> I didn't have the patience to play turn-based RPGs. But now I have more, you know, I have that patience and I'm enjoying them. And Final Fantasy uh, 7 isn't, it, it's no longer a turn-based, uh, at least the new one isn't. So it's a little more action-oriented. But um, I'm definitely going to be playing a lot more of those as uh, I discovered I can now enjoy them after beating a 100-hour game in Persona 5. Never did that before. <laughs> but uh, I think I've discovered some new patients that I never had before. All right, uh, next question. Matt W says, consistency is overrated. Cop one, cop 26, cop 100. Thank you, Matt. Blue Knight says, great coverage as usual, man. How's Final Fantasy VII coming along? It's coming along great. I'm 11 hours in, I'm doing every side quest, so it may take me longer than, you know, the average player, but uh, I'm enjoying it. Matt W says consistency is overrated. Vietnam, Afghanistan. I don't know what you're, <laughs> I don't know what these are about, but thank you, Matt, for your uh, for your super chats. All right, let me grab and I'll keep taking super chats as they come in, but I'll grab some normie ones as well in the chat on the side here. <clears throat> Black Caucus says Sasan didn't make his money from trying to destroy progressives and turning people against each other. Nothing wrong with him buying a home. Did I read that earlier? I think I did, but uh, yes, I agree. MC Dano says, any thoughts on OnlyFans hurting sex workers? I literally just talked about that in my wrap up. Um, my thoughts is it sucks. And I, I don't, I don't know the way around it. Like I, I, I don't know how you stop that from happening because these, I think part of the, 
I think part of the issue for OnlyFans was, uh, uh, I guess they had issues with with banking transactions and, and banks potentially pulling out because of that. And of course, investors, they're worried about that. But if OnlyFans takes that away, <laughs> like what's left? I, isn't that basically one of the only reasons anyone uses OnlyFans? So yeah, uh, it's horrible. It's horrible. And uh, all it does is it, it forces, again, sex work to go underground, where it's not regulated, where, where there is no you know, oversight on any of it. And it's, it's, it's horrible. The dynamic jab says, I love you, David. You're like a cool older brother or an older cousin, cool ass friend who's way smarter than them. LOL. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, jab. I appreciate the comment. Young Nine says, have you tried 12 minutes? I have it downloaded on Game Pass. I I absolutely want to play that. It seems very uh, different. And yeah, I'm going to play that probably tonight, actually. I'll try it out. James Stark says, did you ever play any of the Sonic games? Yes, I did. I never really got into Sonic. It was, I always felt just like I was, I was holding the joystick to the left or the right and just going very fast. <laughs> I don't. I, I I feel like someone's got to show me what the appeal is or how to play it properly. Maybe I'm playing it wrong. I, I just never really, especially compared to something like, you know, other platformers like Mario, it just does not hold up at all, I think. But, you know, I, I'm open to being wrong on that. Maybe I just, I, I don't get the appeal for, for some reason. I don't know. MC Dano says, are you an Xbox player? I'm mainly a PlayStation player, but... I have been craving Halo, so I picked up a, a Series X because I want to be playing some Halo. And Game Pass is is an incredible, incredible deal. Like the first three months is like a dollar a month, <laughs> so I'm like I, I'm definitely signing up to this. It's a ton of free games. Um, in in some ways, I almost feel bad for some of the developers because it's like some of these games I may have actually bought. And then again, if I play a game long enough. Because of who I am, especially if it's an indie game, I'm going to end up buying it, even if I got on Game Pass for free. Because uh, these indie developers especially need to be taken care of. But um, <clears throat> it's just an amazing, amazing uh, value for what you get. MC Dano, did you ever play the Crash Bandicoot games? Yes, I did. Uh, the remakes especially. I, I spent a lot of time on those. They were very well done. I, I enjoy those quite a bit. <laughs> Every question now is just, have you played this game? Have you played this game? Uh, someone asked about Pokemon. I missed your chat now. Pokemon games? James says, have you played any of the Pokemon games? Yes. Uh, I, I don't think I ever actually beat any of them. Uh, when I was younger, I played red and blue. Or red or blue, I forget. I think I played blue. And then I think I played yellow. And then I never really played much after that. <laughs> so I'm sure they've changed a bit since then. But... Um, the, there's a new one coming up that looks a little more uh, open world, Pokemon Arceus, I think. So uh, if that ends up being good, I'll check that out because I, I dig open world games, but we'll see. <clears throat> Tayray88 says, do you think China's Belt and Road Initiative can enter Afghanistan and help the country? Well, they have been... Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. In, you know, In terms of that specifically, I don't know. But I do know that it seems to be great politics to invest in other countries. Uh, at least, you know, in terms of the superpowers doing that. But um, I don't know. I'm not going to claim to know if that will help or not when I don't know the answer. Rhino Wiki says, did you read about the story where federal a appeals court overturned the ban on remote... Let me this again. Read the report where federal appeals court overturned the ban on remote shock devices for the disabled. It's also been abused a lot. Remote shock devices. I didn't even know about these. No, I have not read that story. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. <clears throat> All right. Um, what else?
LD says, "Will you?" By the way, if you want, if there, if you want a, a larger likelihood that I'll see your comment or question, then tag my name, the Rational National, as it's it highlights in my chat. LD says, "Will you be playing Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut?" Yes, I will. I want to play that extra island. I uh, platinum that game, so that game is so, so good. Like <laughs> when we're talking top five games, like if we're talking games I had a ton of fun with. Ghost of Tsushima would be up there for sure. It, I mean, it sounds weird to say, you know, top five of all time and put a game that came out less than a year ago on there, but it, the game was so freaking good. So yeah, I will be returning to that for sure. Lily Rice says, Hassan didn't buy a castle. Leave my eye candy alone. <laughs> I know. That was a joke. I hope people don't think that's serious. <laughs> I defended... If you, go, go watch the beginning of the stream. I defended Hassan. There's, there's no problem at all with buying a home. <clears throat> I should be clear. No problem if you amass wealth in an ethical way. Uh, you don't grift to right-wingers. You don't go on Tucker Carlson to build an audience. You actually educate people with reality. Uh, in terms of this space, if you are honest about what you do, where your influences are, who you're who you're appealing to, and the and the information you're putting out there, nothing at all with buying no, no issue at all with buying a home. Assuming, of course, you're not also exploiting labor in the process of that. But uh, yeah, you know, when it comes to grifters, they can buy their homes, but uh, the way they're amassing wealth is is definitely worth criticism. Adelator says, did you have any business with TYT? Did I have that? We're partners on Facebook. So they share my Facebook videos. That's uh, that's my my business with TYT. Dynamic Jab says, what grade would you give Joe Joe Rogan at Joe Rogan at Biden so far? Is that his middle name? <laughs> I don't think I knew that. Um, <clears throat> isn't it Robinette? Robinette. Anyways, what grade would I give Joe Biden so far? I don't know. Uh, C maybe. He's uh, he's better than Trump, but uh, hasn't really done a whole lot. Is giving cover, giving way too much cover to Mansion and and Cinema. Is not doing enough to get rid of the filibuster, so that it could actually do something, you know, do great things. Um, but uh, you know, seeing him, I I think. Uh, it was Kyle Klinsky that, that put the, that put this out today, basically saying that no president has has been as brave as Joe Biden has on Afghanistan. And or, let me get his actual words because it's he says it a lot better than I just did. <laughs> but basically saying that. Um, let me just find this tweet. I'll be two seconds. Here we go. Found the tweet. Biden's withdrawal from Afghanistan is the most brave thing any U.S. president has done in my lifetime. Changed my mind. It's hard to argue with that. I mean, look at what the if you again, assuming you're looking at this from the lens of pressure from the mainstream media and the establishment. I think he's right. Like they are. MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, of course, but like NBC, ABC, CBS, and the newspapers, they're all going after Joe Biden for pulling out of Afghanistan. And he's maintaining that it was the right thing. He is not pushing back. He's not going back in there, you know, with, with a with a new surge, except to get people out of the country. Um, but he, yeah, he's doing the right thing. And he's doing that in the face of all this mainstream media garbage. So it's... It's almost it, not almost shocking. It is shocking that Biden is actually doing the right thing on, on this. And it, it, that isn't to say he's free from criticism. Of course, as I said in all of my videos on this, that he should have done a lot more to get people out sooner out of the country. Clearly, as we've seen from videos, a lot of people wanted to get out of, out of Afghanistan and he could have got a lot of those people out, resettled refugees a lot earlier than what's happening right now. So that is his big mistake. It's not resettling refugees or, or asylum seekers uh, sooner. That said, 
pulling out is the correct decision. Not keeping a presence around the country is the correct decision. And mainstream media is freaking out uh, about that. <clears throat> Matt W says consistency is overrated housing all over housing all over West. Matt W says you said we can't expect consistency from you. I don't know what the I have no idea what you're referring to. I actually honestly have no idea what you're talking about. Jessica McKenzie says, speaking of climate change, the news has barely covered the massive fires in the West. Uh, Northern California has been covered in smoke for the last few weeks. Yeah. Uh, these, it's only going to get worse, you know, and we're seeing that every year. There was massive heat wave two months ago that killed hundreds of people in, in British Columbia. And, uh, Climate change is one issue that is brings my mood down to zero because it, it is I feel so helpless in the face of it. We we know the science. The public understands the importance of it. Polling shows that people understand the importance of it. The only issue is those in power. And as long as the same people reign in power, then, you know, there's only so much we can actually do. Larry Starkiller says, have you heard the new conservative talking point that if Biden had just followed Trump's exit plan for Afghanistan, there wouldn't have been any chaos? LOL. <laughs> well, I earlier this week I had on, uh, I didn't have on, but I showed a few clips from Fox News where, um, yeah, they're basically saying if Trump was president, this wouldn't have happened. But they don't explain how it would be any different or that they claim it's because you know, Trump uh, was a, a strong man. So the Taliban would have been scared of him. But he, if he was still pulling out, why would they be scared of him? Like it, they, it, they don't. There's no logic to any of any of their <laughs> defense of, of Donald Trump. It really is that. Of course, they have to find a way to still criticize Joe Biden, while um, maintaining, I guess, attempting to maintain the support for pulling out, out of Afghanistan. But they are doing a horrible job at being able to uh, to justify their position. Teddy Ellison says, when vaccines are approved for kids 12 and under, will you support vaccination for all? What do you mean by support vaccination for all? Like mandate? I support you getting the vaccine. I support your your children getting the vaccine. Um, I think if you're going to school around other people, you should be vaccinated. If you're going to a public place, indoors especially, you should be vaccinated. Um, if you work in you know, in a hospital, in, uh, or work with the public, you should be vaccinated. I mean, basically, yeah, <laughs> you should get the vaccine. And I cannot wait. I cannot wait till that's the case. Uh, cause the, the biggest fear right now is kids under 12 may get the virus. And I have a kid under 12, so I have to worry about him anytime we go anywhere. That's, that's the biggest fear I have. Once kids under 12 can get vaccinated, then if somebody wants to expose themselves and, to the virus, then I guess that's their choice. But right now, their choice is potentially hurting children under 12. So that's why I think this is still a, a big, a big issue. Nicoletti says, do you agree with the following statement? The American occupation in Afghanistan was relatively small and relatively cheap. Uh, no, I don't. Law Gnome says, apparently there was an FBI investigation released saying little evidence U.S. capital attack was largely coordinated. Saying U.S. Da, 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 da. Oh, wait. Apparently there's an FBI investigation released saying little, little evidence U.S. capital attack was largely coordinated. Yeah, I don't think it was coordinated. It was, it was instigated by Trump and, and, uh, and right-wing media, but I don't think it was really coordinated. All right. Let me try to get out of here by 5.30. So how about 10 more minutes of chats and then I'll uh, jump out of here.
Adelator says, will you think about giving up if the crazies come back in 2024? <laughs> give up. What does that mean, give up? Uh, politics isn't just about electoral politics. I hope people realize that. It's also about um, organizing. It's about unions. It's about worker power. So in order to have electoral victories, you have to have that 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 power built up, that working class power on the ground already built. So, you know, that's, I think, arguably the, 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 the larger issue. Because if that isn't there, then the victories aren't going to happen. It doesn't make sense to give up ever. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm hopefully going to live a lot longer. I have a child I want to see grow up. So I'm going to keep fighting for a better future, regardless of the situation that we're in. Matt W. says, in my opinion, capitalism is one big grift. And it's a system that we all have to live under, unfortunately. The Fitzy Nader says, any Canadian election thoughts? Well, I covered a couple of Canadian stories, actually several, including the wrap-up uh, in this stream. But overall, my thoughts on the election... I think I still think liberals are likely going to win, but I don't think they'll they'll win a majority. I think they're going to keep their minority, and um, I uh, I don't know. Maybe it's wishful thinking, but I think the NDP have a potential to to grab a few more seats. Um, I think conservatives will likely maybe stay the same, even though their polling right now doesn't look too good, in in most polls, anyways. But you know, in terms of uh, there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of thoughts I could have on the election, depending on what you want to hear about. But uh, I just think it's completely unnecessary. There, there was no need for an election this year. And Trudeau just called it because he wanted a majority. Typical Canadian says, are you going to vote by mail at the advance polls or on election day? Uh, I'm going to vote through it at advance polls. Law Gnome says, thoughts on Tesla's uh, AI day looked very technical and a ton of production for not having any actual product. I saw I saw the clip, actually maybe I can find it, of their, of their robot, <laughs> which is not a robot at all. It is just a man in a suit and it is completely ridiculous, but uh, I'll show you the video. I just think, you know, especially in terms of timelines, don't expect, can't have any music on the stream, that's for sure. I don't think uh, you should expect anything from this, but here's uh, Matt Farah, who is a, a car guy, smoking tire, saying, OMG, first time seeing this video, if you give this moron one dollar, you have lost your last brain cell. <laughs> so here is, here is uh, Elon Musk's AI robot. Wow. Ch so lifelike. How did they do it? Incredible. Oh my, oh, that's, that's definitely just a person in a, in a spandex suit. This is a person in a suit. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And they're apparently going to have, you know, a, a prototype next year. Just look at any time Elon Musk has announced a timeline for, for any product. It's always, he, oh, it's, it's coming next year, and then it's like years later, if it comes at all. So the Cybertruck was supposed to be this year, if not last year, but I know, I know this year for sure. That's pushed out. Uh, self-driving cars, completely self-driving Teslas, was supposed to be five years ago. Still waiting for that one. That's been in beta forever. So just, you know, maybe he'll get this done one day. Maybe his robot will be able to do this one day, but... Don't expect that next year. Uh, it, it's just, it's, I don't know. But my biggest issue with Elon Musk is the amount of money he takes from the public. 
and also the fact that his workers aren't unionized. So he can have these crazy ideas and, and want to, you know, try and push technology forward. But ultimately, if you're going to be a union buster and you're going to steal from the public, then I got issues with you. Back to the chat. Here we go. Prairie Fire, thank you for your super chat. James Stark says, what will force Joe Biden to give us a UBI during this outbreak of COVID? I don't think anything will force him to give you a, a, a true universal basic income. That's not going to happen with Joe Biden. Matt W. says, agreed about climate change and feeling helpless. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. First Cat, if I'm reading your name correctly, says, Hassan made his money on a message of unifying and strengthening the working class and the right pits working class people against each other. Leave Hassan alone, you creeps. Agreed. <laughs> Baron Saturday says I would sell Hassan's jewelry and use that money to pay off our entire national debt. Hilarious. Baron says, play some Rush, one of the best things to come from Canada in a very, very long time. I can't play any licensed music on YouTube, unfortunately. I would love to play music on YouTube. You don't even know. But I cannot. By the way, anybody coming late to, if you're coming to the stream because you want to hear about Hassan, go to the beginning of the video where I discuss <laughs> the fake controversy. And uh, yeah, because I'm seeing some chats. People don't know what's going on. Go to the beginning. You'll see my discussion on it. <clears throat> Are you wearing pants? Asks Teddy. I'm wearing shorts, actually. Hey, if I were wearing pants, I'd be sweating my ass off right now. Axel says, how has your ideology evolved over time and how slash when were you introduced to politics? So it's definitely evolved in the sense that I'm just more educated than I ever was. Um, and every I mean, that's kind of the that's one of the big benefits of doing this job. I mean, there are many downsides. <laughs> like working all the time and being depressed and, you know, reading the news and seeing how shitty everything is. But some of the upsides is you're always learning. So I'm constantly learning. Um, and in terms of my introduction and, and how I've evolved, uh, I, I, I think I've clearly moved more left over the years um, as I have become more informed. But in terms of how I was introduced... What, real, what really got me into politics was Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert. And also, to be fair, uh, the Young Turks. Once I started watching Colbert and, and Stewart, I went online and began watching more political videos. And really, at the time, only the Young Turks uh, existed. That was at least, you know, doing correct critique of what was going on. And, uh, like, I, I remember watching a, t a TYT video and being surprised that they were criticizing Barack Obama. Because I'm like, hey, aren't these guys progressive? They're criticizing Obama. And that kind of, like, <laughs> made me realize, hey, these people are actually, um, you know, giving it to you straight regardless of who's in power. But uh, and, and that there was a way to look at politics apart from just looking at, you know, different parties and, and the horse race around all of it. So, yeah, that definitely helped to evolve my... Uh, my politics and open my mind and, and introduce me to a different perspective. 
<clears throat> Boycott Nabisco, says Mike H. Yeah, I haven't read into that story, but I know that Danny DeVito <laughs> got his verification pulled yesterday, but the, now it's, it's back now. But uh, that apparently came right after he um, tweeted out solidarity with uh, Nabisco workers. <clears throat> Larry Starkiller says, David, have you ever been to Banff Springs? That place is amazing. I have not. One day, one day, hopefully. Ted Still says, thanks for the job you do. Thank you. More comments here. Prairie Fire says, did I read this? I don't think I did. Says, uh, we can get to a carbon deficit within 10 years with current agriculture technology and land man management practices. I'm going to be posting a video on how in about a month. Stay hopeful, folks. We got this. All right. Check out Prairie Fire. Ryan Wiki says Danny DeVito was just made unverified on Twitter a day after supporting the Bisco labor union strike. Stinks of corporate retaliation. Yeah, I just, I'm sure you just saw I mentioned that. Um, it's back now, though. I'm sure they're <clears throat> blaming it on some uh, some technical issue. Uh, it was mistakenly taken away, but there was a lot of pushback after it was taken away. It, you know, I obviously can't say for certain that it was taken away because of what he said about Nabisco, but uh, my understanding is Nabisco is a big, has a lot of ads on, on Twitter, so... I'm sure they got some influence there if they wanted it. Mark O'Brien says, the Young Turks also turned me left, LOL. I think they have for a lot of people. They, uh, it really was like, at the time, especially, just completely foreign to go from watching MSNBC or just, you know, standard cable news or national news coverage of, of politics to them watching the ins and outs of policy creation and, and some Democrats being... Uh, at the time, really, most Democrats being uh, not far left enough and and defending uh, the interest of corporations and understanding that dynamic that like we're talking, you know, 10, 15 years ago that nobody was really talking about that at the time, at least in terms of video news. Uh, I'm sure, of course, it was written about, but in terms of, uh, you know, cable or, or news online or videos, it was definitely a different perspective that you could not get anywhere else. <clears throat> I am losing my voice, if you can tell. So, probably going to be jumping off shortly. Uh, Kinthia says, do you ever watch Roland Martin unfiltered? If yes, what do you think of it? I have watched Roland Martin. Um, I enjoy him. Uh, I know there have been times I've disagreed with him for sure, but uh, I don't know. I, I think he's I think he's pretty good. <clears throat> All right, this may be the last chat because my voice is gone. Tay Ray says, "What do you think of TYT now since Jimmy Dore and Lee Camp don't support them anymore?" Uh, that has no impact at all on my thoughts on TYT. I think TYT has become further left. You look at Anna Kasparian, she's essentially basically now, at least in terms of what she advocates for, very left, anti-capitalist, uh, at least, you know, if not socialist, then still discusses socialist ideas. And uh, I think it's, the reason why the show I think still works and it works really well, uh, especially now, is because of the dynamic between Anna and Jenk. And Jenk really is, you know, he's a capitalist. He should be sort of where, well, maybe not should be, but he, if the center was where Jenk was, that would be great. <laughs> like if that was the center, that'd be fantastic. But um, that, of course, isn't the case. But as I was saying, I think the discussion between Anna and Jenk especially is great. And they, they'll have disagreements, especially on some economic issues and approaches. And uh, I think that's that's helpful. And it's it's good to have those disagreements, but still be but still be logical and rational in your discussion. Like it's it's one thing to have someone on who's, you know, a Trump supporter and have disagreements with that person. Like what's even the point? of you know the, like the cable news shows where they have on you know a trump guy and, and a biden person that's you're not getting anything done you're just having two people support each team 
Whereas with a show like The Young Turks, there's actually different perspectives going on that isn't based in party, but based in their own separate politics. And that's really how these discussions should be in cable news is don't be defending, you know, don't look at politics as a a, uh, a team sport where like you're Democrat, you're GOP, and we're going to fight it out. Look at it as what is your ultimate goal? Is your goal to help the working class? Is your goal to lift people out of poverty? Is your goal to expand health care? To, to, is your goal essentially to help people? Or is your goal just to be a mouthpiece for a, a party or an organization? So I think that's it's important to have that distinction. And uh, very few shows are able to do that. Mar <laughs> Marcos, how do you feel about the Canadian jokes from the show How I Met Your Mother? I love this show, but I don't know any Canadians personally. <laughs> That's, what a random question, but I love it. Um, I I think they're great. Uh, I haven't watched, I mean, I watched that show back when it was on. I forget almost everything. <laughs> like the first four seasons were pretty good. And then it just kind of went downhill from there. Um, so I'm not, I think I ended up, I think I watched like the last few episodes, but I'm sure I fell off at some point because the show got really dumb at some point. But um. Yeah, I got no issues with the Canadian jokes. I thought they were they were fun. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> Dynamic Jab says, will you one day take calls? Uh, maybe. I got to figure out that whole system. I know there's, I think there's a way to sign up for that and, and do that. But, uh, you know, you see when these shows, I'm so inconsistent in when these shows go live. Like, it's supposed to be 3 p.m. It's usually 3 30 or four o'clock or maybe four ten. Uh, so I'm just not, you know, I can't have like a consistent time where it's like Colin at this time during the week and talk to me because I don't, I don't have that. So I don't know. Lindiana Jones says, I miss Michael Brooks. We all do. I'm seeing a lot of comments about, you know, certain grifters on on the left or who who pretend to be on the left. A good way to to find out, you know, who's grift and who's not is look at what they're saying about Joe Biden right now on Afghanistan. Are they criticizing him when they when you know those same people would defend Donald Trump for pulling out of Afghanistan and did defend Donald Trump as I did? I I said it was the right thing to do when he when he decided to uh, sign that agreement. Or are they so are they criticizing Biden or are they, you know, doing the or objectively uh, covering this issue and and seeing that it's great that he's pulling out that's a good way to find out who's grift and who's not because uh it's quite clear right now that biden is doing what he should be doing while the entire mainstream press is fighting him even though there are criticisms to be made about as i said earlier about him not pulling out uh resettling refugees soon enough that clearly is a a big mistake that he made but if you're out there right now jumping in with the mainstream press in slamming Biden over Afghanistan when you know those same people defended Trump when he was doing it. That right there is how you find your grifter. <clears throat> 6J Sadie says, why are so concerned lately with the houses that other personalities buy? I'm not concerned about it. For me, it was a joke. That's why I have Hassan beside a castle in the thumbnail. <laughs> and that's why I, at the beginning of the stream, uh, <clears throat> defended him. Because it doesn't... As long as he's not exploiting labor, as long as he isn't, uh, you know, grifting for the right, then nothing wrong with buying a nice house. Did I hear about Lauren Boebert? Asks Blue Knight. Hear what specifically? I saw her um, saw her tweet about <laughs> building back better, uh, the Taliban building back better, if that's what you're talking about. But otherwise, I, I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, 
N. Stark says, think about this. If Biden ends the Afghan war and passes the $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill, he'll be the most progressive president of my lifetime. <laughs> that's true. That That's true. I mean, I, I don't know how old you are, but <laughs> I assume uh, that is true. Yeah. Jamie says, get out of here. <laughs> Go rest your voice. I will, but I'm having a good time. Matt Ocelot God says, hey, Dave, you should check. You should check. Check talk with Peter Joseph. A lot of progressives are blackpilled on electoral politics, and he's the guy they need to hear from. I don't. Uh, all right, I'll, I don't know this Peter Joseph, but sure. <clears throat> Bobert got sketchy donations. Oh yes, I saw something about that today. I didn't read into it. I just like some of these stories you can see why they don't get a lot of headlines because it's like uh, yeah obviously <laughs> yeah another republican is is corrupt yes 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 they are so yeah it's just this shit that that they get away with meanwhile people on the left are criticizing you know a streamer for buying a house like <laughs> guys got to get your priorities straight look at uh who's actually robbing you blind <clears throat> All right, maybe I'll take that advice and uh and get off. Just a quick scroll up. Maybe I'll grab one more chat. How about that? One more random chat. Your Seattle sends a super chat saying, I love you. The humanitarian disaster in Afghanistan is concerning to me. I care about the women, children, and America and Americans stuck in that country. I hear you. That's the as I said, that's the biggest issue is resettling refugees and not um I mean all US and NATO allies need to be taking in as as taking in whoever wants to come. As they're the ones that created this mess. Okay, I said one more random chat, so let me grab one more random chat. Honestly, this is the best part of my live streams. I just like talking to people. <laughs> like, I could cover news stories, but maybe I should just do this every day. Let's just talk to people in the chat. All right. I guess I'll just, I'll grab this one. Um, D. Walden says, Biden is showing strength. There you go. <laughs> In the face of the mainstream, mainstream press right now, he is indeed shockingly showing some strength. All right. I think we're good. Thank you all for uh, showing up again. And uh, uh, D. Walden again. I mean, this is a good chat. David looks better with short hair. Thank you. Thank you. I also agree with that. I, I definitely agree with that. And I, I also enjoy life mo a lot more with short hair. It's so much easier. All right. Thank you all for uh, coming up or coming up, showing up. I've lost my mind. <laughs> thank you. Marco O'Brien. Thank you. I love you too. Uh, all right, everybody. Nina Turner on TYT tonight. That's right. She's a guest. Check that out tonight. All right. Thank you all. Goodbye. Have a great weekend. I'll be playing some Final Fantasy tonight. Having a good time. Last one here, Sally McLaughlin with the big super chat. Thank you so much. Says, thanks for being you. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>